I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only Son, a prophet and Savior of the world. That there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God, is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you and God be glorified. We're happy this morning to be here to be able to continue in this series. I believe this is the third of the series where we're dealing with the black holocaust. And uh, in that, uh, we want to make you aware of the things that God is no longer, not only doing for us as a people, but with us as a people. <clears throat> in the first of this series, we gave you a statistical report on black suffering worldwide. And uh, the question that we ask you to ask is, what will we tell our children? Uh, what are you going to tell your children when you get old enough and they start asking you questions? Are you the person that's been sitting around blaming everybody but not really educating your children on who they are in this struggle as well as in this diaspora? So we pose that question. And last Sunday, we was going to give you um, another question, and that question I've already answered in a spoken word that I've recently done. And that question, the second of the series, was entitled, uh, White People, Why Do You Hate Black People So Much? And it was entitled, The, the Black Holocaust, and the, the main theme of it is White Christians, Gatekeepers of White Supremacy. So you'll be able to receive that later on as in a spoken word. And today we have something that we believe is going to bless your heart. Now you say, well, why even go to that, to that spectrum? Because right now the world is in a, a, what I would call a super conundrum of colorism and racism and all of the bad actors have came out the closet. And not only are they out the closet, they're going to stay out the closet until this thing come to some type of conclusion. And basically, church, uh, um, the world is in a mess, and it has dragged the body of Christ into that same mess because many of the people that claim to have the faith in Jesus Christ are focused more on uh, the skin color, focus more on how much privilege they can have. And I know it's a difficult thing to deal with. Uh, that's why I'm dealing with it, because God will raise up men and women that's going to tell the truth. John 8 and 32 said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if you are a believer and you love God like you say you do, you should never have any hatred in your heart for any other race group on the planet. That's not a Christian thing to do nor is it a godly thing to do. Taken from Matthew uh, 22, I believe reading verses uh, 39 or 25 through 39. So we have been commanded to love one another. But for some reason, uh, in this Chris kingdom, uh, that is the main issue that the nation, and not only the nation, but the world struggle with. We now have Russia embracing the United States. We have uh, Asians embracing Russia. We have Iran embracing Russia, Tehran, and all of these uh, embracing Russia as far as a bedfellow or uh, protection. We have the United States now is in, in bed with Russia. We have Europe and all of these many other white continents are now finding themselves trying to come together. Just in case if you're not aware, uh, there has been a decree in South Africa that all white people need to leave South Africa. And there's been another decree in uh, Europe saying all black people need to leave Europe. So uh, there is a great, uh, great issues going on in the world today, and the church sleep. And the reason why the church sleep is because the church do not want to deal with uh, the skeleton that's been in the closet for this nation for the last 400 years. 
we are still wrestling over color of skin. We still haven't moved past uh, colorism. We have not moved past eugenics. We have not moved past Darwinism. We have not moved past speciesism. We're still stuck in a conundrum of trying to find out <laughs> which race is superior. And it's all foolishness that comes directly from the pit of hell. And it's been causing blacks and whites to be fighting. Now when we get through it all of it, the issue uh, with uh, the world is black and white. It's not Hispanics, not Asians, it's not, a, not all those are lateral issues. Those are not vertical issues. The issue is always with black and white. Who is superior, who's done more, who uh, contribute more, and that's where the church is now stuck in this same conundrum of how do we fix a problem, America, original sin, how do we fix this problem? And the only way I know to fix it is John 8 and 32, and that is that tell the truth about it. Amen? So um, that's why what we're doing now is telling the truth about it so we can begin to uh, get the things that we want of God out to the people. I am not here to, uh, to beat up on any race group. I'm not here to promote any race group. I am here this morning to tell truth. You want to know who I am? I'm a truth teller. And wherever the truth lands is wherever it lands. Uh, so uh, we're going to get to it. So turn in your Bibles to 2 uh, Chronicles 7 and 14. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. And I want you to be aware of your awareness when you're around other groups. I want you to be aware of your awareness when you're reading the Bible and and make sure that you don't have no evil in your heart so that when you engage in people, you can engage people from an equal position rather than from a slave position. You have to know who you are, whose you are, and where you're going. So Second Chronicles tells us this. It says, if my people, Second Chronicles 7 and 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So God has given us some instructions through uh, his prophet of what he will do for us. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. These are themed scriptures that I don't want you as, as blacks to feel intimidated or feel like somehow you gotta cow down because you're around certain whites. And uh, I don't want white people to feel like they gotta continue lying about who they are when they know that they're not superior. So we both got something to work on, amen? No, we both got something to deal with and we both have something to come clean about because God is requiring that of us. But the church don't want to deal with that because to deal with that means that uh, you create enemies and you have people that won't like you. Well, I'm the pastor that I don't care if they ever like me. I'm, I'm dealing with truth. You know, and God has blessed me to study hard and to learn that all of us are jacked up. Every human being got an issue. We're all messed up. I mean, we tow up. And most of it is selfishness, greed, and pride, and arrogance, and all of that. So uh, we want to be honest about this. So uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9 says this. It says, we are trouble on every side, yet not distress. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. And as uh, Africans who happen to live in America, you can take that as kind of like your anchor verse for your social construct, that as you live through this life, you'll know that uh, as a people, we've been through all that, but we are still here. <laughs> Come on, give yourselves a hand, praise. We are still here no matter how bad it's been, no matter what plans they have, we are still here from, it, from uh, injecting us with all kinds of disease from the Willie Lynch syndrome, 
from all of that mess they put up on us, we're still here and not just here, but we are thriving. I told you uh, a couple of Sundays ago that uh, I believe that Black History Month in its purest sense should be for us as blacks to give a, strati a statistical report outing of what blacks have done all year to empower other blacks. I, I think it's critical for, uh, ain't no sense in having Black History Month if you haven't done anything all year to empower other blacks. What you celebrating for? I mean, we already know that we were swinging on trees, you know, like strange fruit. We already know what happened to us in the halls of ships. We already know that uh, many of us leaped off ships, forefathers, and had schools of sharks following the ships for 3,000 miles. We already know the horrification and the brutalization that have been put upon us as a people. You know, it's fine to know it, but what we're doing now? So I believe that we have to morph that. We have to morph that into action. So this month, these little mere 28 days, this month should be 28 days of mega celebration of what we're doing for ourselves today. How many can receive it? Now that simply means that we must begin to even more get our sons and our daughters and teach them how to be good citizens in this country. Get our sons and our daughters to train them up knowing their history. Your son should know this history before he's 12 years old. He should be celebrating. He should be well-versed in his history at 12. That's why we have the IPA Academy starting at 12, so that they can get some history about who they are. Your sons and your daughters should not be leading the system as far as those that become mostly incarcerated. They shouldn't be leading the system in gangbang. We already know. We already know, and if you don't know, you should know. We already know that the landmines and traps are already set up for you. They're already set up. The landmines and traps. The traps are drugs and guns and unemployment and poverty. We're not surprised about that. We already know it's set up so you can fill the empty cages of the new plantation, modern-day slavery, while you're housed in penal institution of this prison industrial complex. How many understand what I'm talking about? The system has set up for you so your sons and your daughters can go in and out of prison, and by the time they finally get some sense in their head, they're 45 years old trying to figure out what they're going to do next. So we know it, and since we know it, we shouldn't begin to play into it. Our children need to know how to read, how to write. They need to focus on mathematics and learn how to do math. We don't have dumb children. Our children are not dumb. The only reason why they're not excelling in their books is because we have lazy parents that want more for themselves than they do for their children. Your children can learn anything. Black children can learn anything. There's nothing that a black child cannot learn. We can do repositive of a repositive of words and quote, quote words for an hour straight. Our kids can learn five, six rap songs without missing a word. And you telling me they can't learn? They can learn stanzas of words and phrases and things of that nature. But it's not the children. It's the parents. The parents that do not want to take time with their children to educate them to be great. They don't want to take the time. It takes time to make sure your son or your daughter can read. It takes time to make sure your, your son or your daughter understand mathematics. It takes time to make sure your son and your daughter. You got to put the time in. You can't expect for people, your teacher, to teach your son or your daughter something that they should have learned before they even got to the classroom. How's this sound going? They took what they should have learned before they even got to the classroom. Why your first grade teacher got to teach your child how to say their alphabets? Why they got to teach your child how to count to 10? Why they got to teach your child how to read their first letters? Why they got to teach your child how to be able to pray and do those right things? I say to you, it's these lazy parents that want everything free but won't give nothing to their children. 
And the first thing we want to do is blame white folks. You can't blame white folks on what's in your house. You got to be the king of what's in your house or the queen of what's in your house. You had these babies, now teach these babies. You don't get to sit down and say, well, they can't learn, and the devil is a lie. Your child can learn anything any other child on the planet can learn and learn it as better as them. You're not going to tell me about Africans. We're the ones that created mathematics. We created hieroglyphics. We created science. We created a whole lot of other stuff that we never get credit for. We are brilliant people, but through laziness. We pass that garbage on to our children, and now our children are being locked up in the new plantation, prison industrial complex. And they're sitting in these cages, losing their mind because parents have dropped the ball. I'm here to tell you it's time to pick the ball up. Stop telling your kids what they can't do and start telling them what they can do. Stop lying to your children. See, if your self-esteem is not good, your children's self-esteem is not going to be good. If you're a quitter and you quit on yourself, your child has a, has a tripwire in them to quit when they run into the same problem you ran into and quit. See, quitters breed quitters. Winners breed winners. If you're a winner, you're supposed to breed another winner. You don't let your child be a loser while you're sitting up and, and, and you're a champion, but you got losers that come right after you. You got to decide to win. You got to want to win. And every phase of your life, and it starts with your children. Man or woman of God is a zero if your children can't be your heroes. Your children are supposed to be your hero. They're supposed to be striving to do much better than you. If they're doing what you're doing, you fail. It's always reaching higher than your father and your mother. Now, it's going to be a journey. But in the end, you can say, hey, I've at least accomplished what my dad has accomplished, and I got one step ahead. Holla back. And for any parent to want their son or their daughter to be behind them like, well, my kids ain't going to ever do what I did, that's a arrogant, stupid spirit. Look to your name and say, that's a stupid spirit. We don't, we don't get happy because our kids are... Lord, help us. We don't get happy because our kids are not thriving. We don't get happy because our kids are locked up. There's no happiness in the fact that our kids are addicted to stuff that they can't break loose from. Who's happy about that? We want our children to thrive. We want our children to know that they're great. And if you come from a great mother or father, therein should be your calling card. Amen. Therein should be the thing to say, uh-uh, devil, you a lie. I got to go get it. Look to your neighbor and say, I got to go get it. I mean, tell them, say, I got to go get it. You can't be sitting around and, and, and crying about everything. Keep up pacifying your mouth, all upset, toe up, hollering and screaming and doing nothing. I got time to raise no losers. Ain't no losers up in here. Will all the losers stand up? That's what I thought. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to stand up and, and admit that they're a loser? Will all the winners stand up? Amen. If you believe you're a winner, stand to your feet. I don't care if your knee hurting, your ankle hurting, your back hurting, your neck all messed up. You know how the devil likes to try to keep you down with sickness. Can everybody say, I'm a winner? Say, I'm a winner, and I always win. I don't sit on down. You got to take authority over yourself. So we come to celebrate black history from this point forward. It's a celebration of who we, who we are, you know. How many people have we helped? How many people have you helped get in business? How many black businesses are you supporting? 
How many black people are you lifting up? How many black kids are you trying to teach how to read? How many black kids are you trying to influence? How many black adults that you're trying to have reconnecting relationship with? Who you with? We, we as a nation have to build one another up because the whole world, and hear me when I say this, the whole world is trying to beat the black man and the black woman down, and they're trying to do it every day of the week. The only people we really have is ourselves and a few white people that are in it for the cause. Like I said, a few that are in it for the cause. Now, there are some that just don't give up, you know. But you have to have your mind made up that Black History Month is going to be a month where we come to celebrate what we've done for that year. How many can agree with that? Nobody got to be talking about slavery all the time, going back to stuff. We already know that, okay? You know more about slave history than anybody because you lived it. Your forefathers lived it. I'm only maybe two generations from it. My great-great-grandfather was preaching in the year of 1850. Fact, got it on record. So he was preaching during the time of slavery. That's why I don't care what people think about me. If my great-grandfather can preach during slavery and I got all this freedom, so there's a warrior spirit that's been passed on. You have to take up your mantle and be who you know you're supposed to be. And stop crying about your condition. Amen? You got to stop crying about your condition and take your position. And know that the fight continues, the struggle continues. But enough about that. We're going to give you this word this morning. And, and I really believe your spirit will be refreshed to know that al Kabu land, the original name of Africa, is doing fine, but she has some issues that has to be worked out. So the text for this morning is entitled, What is the Problem in Africa? What is the problem in Africa? The problem in Africa is, is European puppet masters which feed the corrupt leaders of Africa from the top down using the five Ps. Power, property, prosperity, prestige, and bombosity. And the, the word bombosity simply means a person that feels self-important. In my research, of some of the great leaders of the great continent of Africa, I heard many say this. They said this about us who was brought here to America as slaves. It said that we never forgot about you. In fact, they said they bragged about us, how we fought our way to freedom. Now hear me now, this is what Africans are saying about you who happen to be Africans who live in America. They brag on you. They talk about your strengths. They talk about your stick to it, isn't it? They talk about the fact that how you have fought for so long and that you ended up being president of the United States. Amen. They're bragging on you. They're not mad at you. Now, there are some Africans over there that don't know their history. They have to come to America to find their history because the history in Africa has been colonized by the colonists, and many of that history has been burned up. And if you really want to find out African history, do a study on Great Britain and Germany. Or more than that, go to the Catholic Church. They have isolated our history, put it in tombs and boxes, so that the African don't know who they are. I'm not saying African American. We, we are in position to go educate Africa. Africa goes to a certain point, but a lot of times they can't go back to the biblical times. And as a result of that, because that history has been stolen. 
So over in America and with Europe and with Germany and with Asia, we get a chance to get history that even the Africans didn't get, okay? So Africans over in Africa has to be educated about themselves. And that's what's going on now. And now that the, the news is coming out and a lot of Africans are learning more, there is a shift in the world. Hear me now when I say this. I'm re this is real. There is a shifting going on in the world right now where you got Africans telling Europeans, leave the continent. I don't think you heard what I said. They're telling them, leave the continent. There are Europeans telling Africans, leave the continent. Russian, Russian blacks are now being told to leave Russia. Asian blacks are now being told to leave Asia. China blacks are being told to leave China. There's, there's a shifting going on in morality and in values. And it's like eugenics is now on steroids where each group is trying to claim their power. But what I'm going to share with you today, my prayer is that, that it doesn't go that far because we already know what North Korea is prepared to do. And whether you know it or not, North Korea and South Korea are at the beginning phases of signing a joint agreement that they are now one. That's already taking place. It's going on right now. The Olympics has brought them to a new way of thinking. Now that they have nuclear bombs, they both want to come together under one tent, one umbrella. So we're in a season right now where we as a people, as black people, have to come together and realize that things are shifting in the atmosphere. I had uh, one young man was telling me, well, is man going to blow himself up? Is man going to kill himself? I said, God is not stupid, meaning that man will never destroy himself as long as God is God. Now, he may hurt himself, but he won't annihilate himself. Because if he annihilate himself, then we have to say, why do we have the judgment? What happened to the great white throne judgment <laughs> if everybody going to kill themselves? So my point to you is this. The world is going through right now a shifting and that shifting is the fundamental foundation of the shifting of colorism is all in hate, pride. And that's what the world is going through. So Black History Month should be celebrated to the fact that we don't hate any race group. We're just doing what all other race groups have been doing for the last few centuries and that's loving themselves. And we've been loving everybody else, but not really loving ourselves. If you can agree with it, give God a hand praise. So the Africans in Africa are bragging on you. They're calling you their heroes and sheroes. They brag about how we built America. They brag about the fact that uh, when we came to America, that how we sustain our lives while living in America. They're talking about you in a loving way. But they brag also about how, not only how we build America, as they took, as they too can build Africa. Africa is in a rebuilding stage. Africa is truly the mother and of all civilization that was colonized by the Europeans in 1884, which left Africa depleted of hope, yet full of great material wealth. Africa is rich in oil and natural resources. The continent holds a strategic position. It's the world's largest or the world's fastest growing region and have direct investments and 30% of the Earth's remaining minerals, resources, are in Africa. Church, in short, 
Africa is the richest continent in the world, and everybody knows it except us. When I say the richest continent in the world, that's exactly what I mean. Africa has everything everybody else wants. You have to ask yourself the question, why would God place us, these melanated folks, on the richest continent on the planet? Because God knew in his heart that since we are the most loving, the most accepting, the most hospitable people, he knew that we wasn't going to push any other group away when they came back. They call it colonization, but God calls it get your stuff and build your nations because if Africans had a turn on every group that came to Africa, they, we would have no Europe, we would have no Greece, we would have no Asia, have no China, have no Russia. They wouldn't exist. So God had to allow us as a people to be a loving people to be able to receive those. And in that love, we got colonized. Now, some of you, uh, when I say that, what I simply mean is, Kings and queens embrace the Europeans. They embrace, they embrace the British. They embrace the, uh, the Arabs. And they embrace all of those. When they came in, we were loving them and, and taking care of them, but they turned on us and started taking all of our culture. They was taking everything that black people had built. And to this day, they're still taking our culture. They're still taking our kings and queens. They're still whitewashing them. But see, sometimes when, when black, black people talk about this, black people get feel, start feeling bad. Well, why you got to see it all like that? And, you know, uh, you know it, it, it's okay. Ain't nobody going to come in and shoot you. It's, it's okay to embrace, to embrace the fact that our people have done a lot of major things to contribute to the world. What I find out the most sometimes when I'm preaching or teaching or doing lectures, I find that I get the most resistance from black people because black people like to be good slaves. They don't want to make no noise on the plantation. You know, don't say that. You know how years ago when somebody was trying to teach you how to read, you know, you always had that coon that would come over and say, now don't do that. The master going to kill you. Don't be, don't be teaching them how to read. The master ain't coming, Okay. You ain't got to be scared. And don't be looking around saying, we got two white women up here. These are my babies, okay? They know. They know. They can't be in this church without knowing. They know I love them, but they know they're going to get the truth. And then when they go out and talk to some of their friends, they'll be able to say, no, it wasn't like that. <laughs> Uh, no, it wasn't quite like that either. So we don't hold back because white folks show up. Matter of fact, what we try to do is make sure that they're educated because I think the majority of people in America that really, really are moving in a lot of ignorance are white young people. They've been sold a lie, and they think that the world belongs to them, not knowing that the world belongs to all people. Amen? Okay. So... Uh, don't be scared. <laughs> Just relax and receive this word, and uh, you know, don't you know, don't don't be scared. That's all I can tell you. Okay. Africa is the home of more than fifty-four nations, and it has more than two thousand languages. Now, when I say more than. When I say more than 54 nations, that means that there are some islands out there that have 500,000 people or some other areas that they don't particularly count. So we like to say 54 nations. So when I say more than, I'm accounting for some of those other places out there with 200,000, 500,000, or close to maybe a million or so that could be called nations. Everybody got it? That's where the more than comes. Africa's population right now has, Africa, the continent, has the youngest population in the world, ranging anywhere from as far as 18 to 35. And they are brilliant. And there's a clarion call right now to wake them all up. And they're waking up. Have you ever seen 
uh, a child get up, like they get up in the morning and it takes them a while, they gotta stretch and, and they gotta, you know, well that's where Africa's at right now. She is waking up. Now when she wake up, the next thing she gotta do is get up. And she's in the waking, getting up phase, okay? But I want you to know how important she are. Africa is home of more than 54 nations, 2,000 languages. The sub-Sahara Africa has six of the world's fastest growing economies. They ain't gonna tell you that. that you won't get that on CNN or MSNBC. North Africa counts for vast oil and natural gas deposits. The Sahara hold the most strategic nuclear ore and resources such as coltan, coal, copper, among many others, are in abundance on the continent, untapped riches, yet she struggle to realize her full potential. That's why everybody go to Africa. You think they're going to, to visit the people in the bush and to see lions, tigers, and bears. No. They're going to see where the coal mines are, to see where the diamond mines are, and they brag about it when they get to the United States. And then we have a president, 45, calling the continent a S whole co continent and other continents when he got his boys over there right now getting billions out the ground. The issue is they don't want you to know how rich it is. They don't want you to know where you came from because when you know where you came from, then you'll hold your head up and stick your chest out and pull your pants up and be who God needs for you to be. So they love it when you're happy and stupid. They love it when you're happy and you come to church and praise in the Lord, hallelujah, and you go home and you're you struggling to do anything. They love it when you're around particular pastors that are afraid to talk about the truth, selling you a bunch of lullabies, trying to tell you you can't have it now. You're going to have to get it on the by and by. You got to die before you get what you should have right now. They love it when you're dumb and stupid and don't know what you're doing. They love you to be in churches that can just tell you a bunch of garbage but won't give you the truth in love. So therefore, you come to church and get high, go home and, 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 and get beat up by the devil all day long. See, the issue is that as black people, we have to understand that our fight is a continuum. You are born into the struggle whether you like it or not. When I was nine years old, I was chased by the Ku Klux Klan. And, and, uh, and, and when I say chase, I mean chase. Jumped out the car, they, they told me, get in this car, you in? And me at the time was getting ready to get in the car and I looked and saw another little black boy in the back seat. And I started screaming and started running home. Ran home, leaped up on the porch. They bagging the car up, got the car back and, and I'm bamming on the door, screaming, mom, open up the door. And mom finally open up the door. She gets on her knees and start praying. And they were still out there banging on the door, banging on the door. And my mama prayed until they left. Now, bump what you think. I'm talking about what I know. I know I was called to deal with this issue. I know I was drafted to deal with this issue. And I know that God has purpose in this issue. And that purpose is, the ultimate purpose is, is to get people to love one another for who they really are. Not for these stupid games you're playing trying to be somebody else and denying yourself. You got to make it up in your mind that it's real. And she prayed and they banging on the door. And they finally left. And therein, what was in me was a root of hatred for white people. Couldn't stand the sight of white people. Didn't even want to be, didn't even want to be in the same vicinity of white people. A little black boy, I'm saying, well, why y'all picking on me? I ain't do nothing to y'all. I just left my friend's house. I'm on my way home. Why are you trying to drag me in the car? I couldn't understand it. 
So the hatred that was in them got into me, but God brought it out of me when he had me to meet a young man by the name of Jack Lafferty, who happened to be white. And as a result of going to his house, I told him I would never come to your house because I know your parents are racist. He finally invited me to his house. His mother came outside and, come over, son, come over. When I got into their house, she treated me like a son, and that was the beginning of my healing from racism from white people. Then I went on a mad dash of learning who I was. And I found out this melanation, this black boy, had purpose. And I found that out at 16, 20, and 17, and I've been in a study of African history from that point on to now. And my whole thing is to bring race groups together. God says you got to work on two tracks, the kingdom of God and the social construct of your people. So I got to go with grace and truth. <laughs> so when I go with grace and truth, the result would be that hopefully we can come together before the king returns. That's the end goal. But we can never come together if we lie to each other about who we are. If we lie to each other about our history. The white man just got to get over it. We are first man, first woman, first family, first nation, and first builder of civilization. He has to get over that. We was here first. You may not like it. You may not like me saying it, but it's the truth. Until that take place, we're all going to be on this stain of sprinting, trying to see who was first. Well, it ain't seeing who first, it's knowing who was first. And everything we've done, that's why he's given us so much compassion. He's given us so much love. Years ago in college, if a white girl called herself messing around with a black, black guy in college, the parents would disown him. We're not paying your tuition anymore. We disown you. You're not in this family. So what does the little white girl do? She goes home back to Chicago with her boyfriend. And everybody may be a little frustrated with it. May not want it to happen. But that old grandmother said, come on over here, baby. That mother, and all of a sudden, all the arms are open. And she's received in the home of the black male. We are wired to love. We love everybody. Agents can come and they set up stores in our community. We love them so much that we give them all of our money. <laughs> Hispanics come and they set up shop in our community. We love them so much that we just give them everything. Why? Because we, we, we have been wired to love others but we have been trained to hate ourselves. So our natural tendency is always to push others up. But that ain't what the scripture says. Go to Matthew chapter 22. That is not what the scripture says. The world is counting on us loving them. And as long as we love them, they get rich, and we complain about our condition. I believe it's Matthew chapter 22. Let's go down to verse 34. The great commandment. I want you to get this now. It says, but when the Pharisee had heard that he had put the Sadducee to silence, they were... They would gather together. Then one of them, which was a what? Lawyer, asked him a question, tempt him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This 
is the first and great commandment. He said that's the first and great one. God is first. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's the first one. He sung. You hear me? He sung the whole 613 commandments into two verses. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy, with all thy soul and with all thy mind. There's some say uh, strength, etc. Then he said, this is the first and great commandment. So we're talking about 613 commandments is now being put into two verses. And he said, verse 39, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. As black people, we have, haven't had problems with loving everybody else. Our biggest issue is loving ourselves. You've heard me say before, as black people, we have no problem with personal self-esteem. You like to look good. Yes, you do. You want to dress good? You want to make sure you get a good job? You want to make sure you driving something nice? Your personal self-esteem is not your issue. You came from slavery, so personal self-esteem was not your grandmama issue. Your grandmama loved herself, but she, could, she didn't like Miss you know, Lulamate down the street. Our issue is not personal self-esteem. Our issue is collective self-esteem, group self-esteem, people self-esteem, nation self-esteem. And how do we prove it? Because we have self-esteem to love ourselves, but we killing one another every day. If somebody throw a snake in your bed, and the snake is in your bed sizzling all around, what you going to do with the snake? Are you going to get out the bed or get bitten by the snake? You got a choice to make. Get out the bed or get the snake out the bed. If drugs and guns and poverty have been allowed to be in our community, we're going to either do what? Get the snake out the bed so we can thrive, or we're going to be bitten by the snake and die. What's the point? Can't nobody stop us but us. We've been making excuses too long. Well, the white man won't give me a job, start a business. Well, I ain't got the money. Then get four or five other people with you to help you start the business. We thrive as a people off the village concept. There's no such thing as I made it by myself. If you want to succeed in a business, you need to make sure you got people around you that care about you, that want you to succeed. And as you succeed, you help them to succeed. The village concept. It's called corporate economics, rotating economics. It's your time now. Five years from now, it's going to be mine. We're going to get you in a business, and we're going to get it up and thriving. Where you're making your money now, I'm going to need you to help me get mine going. That's rotating economics. We won't do that. And the reason why we're suffering is because we love to build everybody else up while tearing one another down. Can the church said that's over? So it's a new day, new minds, and we're moving in a new direction. See, all the nations around the world are getting rich off of Africa's resources, Shell, VP, France companies, and others. And all of the nation and all of the people in America are getting rich off the African resources. <laughs> They're getting rich off you. Your communities are still going down. Your houses are going down. The numbers of murders in your community are going up. People are dying every day. Mothers are, are dying and, and all kind of stuff going on in our community. But yet, they know you're going to take your dollar and go give it to them. You are paying for your own destruction. But yet, you have the nerve to blame the white man for where you at. You poison the well. And as the well is being poisoned, you're helping everybody else but yourself. The only people you can truly blame is yourself. As the world is getting rich off Africa, 
America is getting rich off of you. $1.2 trillion you bring in your community. And in 2020, it's going to be 1.5. Some say probably 1.7. But $1.2 trillion leave the black community in 15 minutes. And you wonder why wherever there are blacks, there is destruction and mayhem and violence. We got to go get white state troopers to come and protect us from our children. I'd rather just flat go to die, just die and go to hell before I let my son keep me in the house while he out robbing folk. Dad, don't come out the house. Don't tell me what to do. And the devil is a lie. Our issue is our children are running wild while we're blaming white folks. Why haven't y'all come and protect our cities? We need the F, we need the CIA to come and, and set up a place because we can't stop Snook Snook, Junebug and his gang out there. We can't stop them. Where the father's at? Where the mama's at? Your little girl swinging on the pole and you at home telling me you can't control it. The point I'm making is that we got to have racial hygiene and we got to get to the point where we love ourselves so much until sometime we may have to just make that sacrifice. People come to America, set up tent in your neighborhood, and they're rich in five years or less. And you're still living in the housing project. You, I mean, you, and, and you're comfortable living in the housing project. What are we going to do? Now, hear me now. The problem in Africa is the same thing. Get this now. How America goes is how Africa is going. Africa is, is in the same position. All the money, all the wealth, but they're still living. Some of them are still living in shiny town. Some of them still still don't have what they need to have because we still got people over there fighting against each other. And that was one of the things that I really didn't care for with the, the Black Panther movie. I'll let you see it. I'm going to leave that alone. I don't want to bust your bubble. But uh, I'm sick and tired of us going against each other. And the white man got to always ride in on the horse. Negroes, stop all that. He coming to save the day, and, 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 and you looking like, well, we's the kings of doers, and with eyes of you's a master. We's a needs you. We's a good niggers. And you get your little job, and you work in corporate. Now you think you're special. I'm not like those other Negroes. Oh, you're worse than the other Negroes. <laughs> That's the same thing going on in Africa. What I'm telling you now, hear me now, what I'm telling you now is the same thing going on in Africa. Remember the five Ps, okay? Most black folks are still caught up in these five Ps. And what are the five Ps? The fi and, and these five Ps are played against you to go against someone else. It's not just Willie Lynch that's messing you up. It's these five Ps. The first one is power. I want the power. I want to run it. Ain't nobody going to tell me nothing. The second one is property. I want some property. You know, bump what us as a group should have. Bump turning uh, Detroit. Can everybody say Detroit? Bump turning Detroit into a community. Detroit should be a community where it's 85 to 95 percent of black people, but now it has been made into a close, closely moving to a diverse community where everybody else is in Detroit and many black folks don't live there anymore. The same is true in East St. Louis. It's a slow drag. Can everybody say slow drag? A slow drag is that we're going to drag you out slowly. 
drag you out slowly, and then we're going to make beautiful cities and places that you should have owned. He said, well, what? they just waiting on us to move. What are you doing when you're there? Ain't nobody got time to come to tell you how to, how to take care of your cities. What are you doing? You've been there for 70 years. You haven't done nothing. So it's okay. We're going to put the noose around your neck and drag you on out and just sit you up somewhere because you don't even know how to run nothing. <laughs> Y'all fight too much. Ain't nobody got time for all that. So we're going to let it run down, get you on out of there, and then we're going to show you how you do it. We're going to put up nice little beaches along the Mississippi River. We're going to connect the, the, the cross of the river to the baseball park, connect all that right downtown St. Louis. You ain't doing nothing. You're blaming a white man for nothing not being done when all you can do is everybody drop your rocks and come together and say we're going to create a vibrant community because you own the land. You ain't renting the land. You own the land. <laughs> Same thing going on in Africa. I'm, I'm getting ready to blow your mind here in a minute. Help us, Holy Ghost. So they refused to, so the five Ps, thank you. The five Ps, just so you remember, are you a person that's always trying to get power, but you get the power, don't want to help nobody? My mother told me a long time ago, she said, son, whenever you get anywhere, anything look like it's successful, always reach back to other people, especially your own people. Then property, then popularity. See, we got these Negroes that, that want these last three Ps. They want popularity. Look at me rather than look at us. Look at what I've done rather than look at what we are doing. Look at me. Look how I'm dressed. Look at what I drive. Look at where I live. Look at me. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Look at me. Popularity. Stuck in a conundrum of wanting to be first, not knowing if you first and us as a people last, you still last. Are you with me, Izzy? See, because if, if, if you make a billion, you're just a black person with a billion that they still can call the N-word. But if all of us are thriving together, then they have to recognize us as a group rather than an individual. It's a, it's a classic old strategy. Let's divide these Negroes and conquer them one by one. And they've been playing that on you for the last 5,000 years. And you would think that we've made it through that one, but we're still right in it. Oh, Willie Lynch. Turn the dark-skinned slave against the light-skinned slave. Light-skinned slave against the dark-skinned slave. Turn those that can read against those that can't read. Make sure you get the older men mad at the younger men and the younger men mad at the older men so they can just cancel each other out. Or just turn them loose on each other. Turn those that live on the farm against those that live in the master's house. Turn the field hand against the houseboy. Turn those that have good jobs against those that don't have a job. Help us, Holy Ghost. You thinking you special because you got a good job, but you bump into a guy on the street that's struggling to find a job, and you think, I'm the man. No, the guy on the street that's trying to find a job could be the man to save your life. Holla back. We need each other. Until we recognize that, we're playing right into the puppet master's hands. So you got power, prosperity, I mean, uh, uh, property, then pop, power, property, then you have uh, popularity, then you have prestige. Have you ever seen a Negro that won't prestige? Or one that loved to, be, loved to have bombosity? You know, bombosity. He, he walks around with, I'm the only one. He's the one that moved into the neighborhood you know, moving to a real nice to do neighborhood. And it, it, it's amazing how God has a way of getting you to understand that you have something wrong with you. 
You move into a real nice neighborhood that you thought nobody else black can get there but you. Maybe it's a $300,000 home, $400,000 home. Maybe it's a million dollar home and you got there and you and your wife and kids feel so good that you're out in a uh, neighborhood where everybody white lives and you get to be the special one. And all of a sudden, here's what happens. Somebody will win a lawsuit. You know, Snook, Snook, Bebe, and Shaquita. Win a lawsuit and move right next door to you. <laughs> And if you get mad because Snook Snook and Bebe and Shaquita live next door to you, you got an issue. You got an issue because you're thinking you were special, but God will have it so that the person you think you're better than will move right next door to you. That's why you just got to love people, man. So you have pomposity. Now, as we get ready to wrap this up, we're getting, getting somewhere closer. Africa has to learn how to sit at the table of civilization. It was Professor Patrick Lumumba of Dakar Salam, Tanzania University, who said, Africa is learning how to sit at the table of civilization. Listen to what he said. He said, there are three seats available. One is the diner. The second one is the waiter. And the third one is the food to be eaten. He said, Africa has chosen to be the food to be eaten for centuries. But now Africa is choosing to be the diner and no longer to be the food to be eaten by other nations. He went on to say that Africa has planned, have planted the tree, and generations have watered the tree, and now Africa will soon be able to enjoy the generational wealth that comes from the tree. But in the meantime, Africa is in a serious reset mode. Leaders are going through a restructuring of the continent. Africa must disconnect herself from Europe puppet masters, which are feeding her corrupt leaders. The problem in Africa is not the people. The problem in Africa is her leaders. So I'm, we're answering that question. What's the problem in Africa? It's leadership. Wicked leadership that are operating from the five Ps. Listen to this. Africa has great university but none of their students build Africa. The students was told to go and to subdue the world, but the world has came into sub subdued Africa. Africa at this time cannot feed herself. Most of the stuff Africa gets, she gets from China, she gets from Russia, she gets from Europe, and even when it comes down to uh, the sick, Africa's great leaders have to go to other places to get healed, like India. Nigeria population right now, I believe, is 250 million in population. They have a $500 billion economic, but the president has to travel to other countries to get treatment for his health care. Africa has great universities, PhDs, and much more much, but most of the impact is not made in Africa. They have, like I said, they have universities. They have uh, PhDs, engineers. These are some smart people, but they're making no impact on the continent. Africa produced civil engineers, but the Chinese are the builders of the bridges and roads. Africa produced medical doctors, but they go to India in order to get their sick healed. Are you hearing what's going on? Africa is a continent of 1.5, maybe 1.2, 1 1.5 billion people, but struggles to feed herself. Africa, uh, you can change the forest, as uh, Dr. Lumumba said. You can change the forest, but the monkeys are the same. Meaning that if you don't change the mind of the people that live in a particular diaspora, you can dress everything up, but they're still going to perform the same way. 
That's why we can build our cities all over the nation, but if we don't change the mind of those that live in those cities, sooner or later they will tear it down. So Africa is a great nation, but the minds of Africa remain the same after the colonization. Africa produced agricultural graduates, but the Jews are teaching them dry land agriculture. So they have people that can do it all, but other people come and teach them how to do it. Why? That's low self-esteem. That is a drag on your mentality. The simple problem of Africa is the problem of, of poison leadership expressed in the five Ps, power, property, popularity, prestige, and bombosity. Africa needs a single currency. In Africa, with all of the nations, they don't have a single currency. So therefore, if you go to Nigeria and then you want to go over to uh, Ghana, many times their currency will change. Africa needs a single currency. Like in the United States, we have a single currency, but we have at least 51, 52, 52 states in the United States. And, and wherever we go, if I go to Alabama, it's still the same dollar. You know, if I go to Mississippi, same dollar. Go to New York, same dollar. Africa needs a single currency for the whole continent. Not only a single currency, but a single bank. It needs a single army with a single command. Africa is in the process of getting that. Africa has been independent for over 50 years after the colonization, but what has she done with it? Remember the five Ps. She's been released from colonization for the last 50 years but yet still remain the same in some ways. Africa must stop lamenting and living in sorrow of the past. In other words, when you've been beaten and broke down for so long, your tendency is to live in that. In other words, victims live in being victimization. They live in the fact that they were victimized, and it takes sometimes years to come out of that. But she's rising. She's coming forth. Africa has been independent for over 50 years. Africa must stop lamenting over a sorrow. So the question for China, China is now going to Africa. Some would call it trade, but others would call it raid. The riches of Africa. Let me give you just a, a rundown on that real quick. South Africa is the place of gold. Nimbia has uranium and diamonds and fish. The Democratic Republic of Congo, diamonds and, oil and gold and copper and cobalt and, and all of those things. Nigeria is uranium. Guinea and Angola is oil. Mozambique and Tanzania is natural gas. Zimba uh, Zimbia is copper. Brussels is is uranium. Nigeria and Ghana, again, is oil and cobalt. There was a man by the name of Professor Patrick Lumumba, a.k.a. PLO, University of Desar Salaam, Tanzania, who spoke to the corruption in the African leadership. This brother is brilliant. You get a chance to look him up. Then we have another brother by... Nana Akufu Adu, President of Republic of Ghana, who said in the 72nd United Nations Conference, he said, Africa do not want any more of aid or money from any European nation. He said, Africa can take care of herself. Now, this is an African telling all the European nations, we don't want your help. They're taking back land, like in South Africa right now, where some of the people that are out there doing herding and shepherd, a lot of them are coming up missing. Some of them are being killed because the Africans feel that the land belongs to them. And when the colonial went in, they start uh, blocking off land. The continent of Africa never had borders. So if you wandered into my land, I didn't kill you, you know. But when the Europeans came, the first thing they did was start to remap the whole continent of Africa. And therefore, that's how you got borders. 
So those ancient Africans or those that know certain land belongs to them, they're telling them they got to get off the land. That's what's going on today. So Africa has a problem, but she's beginning to shine. Like I said, President uh, Nana Akufu Adu has told the Europeans all over the world, we don't need your money, we don't need your support. We're getting ready to do our own thing in Africa. I mean, why don't you give God a hand praise for that? It's okay to celebrate you. But here's a brother here that I want you to look him up. Everybody look him up. His name is Dr. Thomas Mensa. That's M-E-N-S-A-H. He's a Canadian chemical engineer and inventor. He is an inventor of the bullet, of, excuse me, of the fiber optics and nanotechnology. That's N-A-N-O-T-E-C-H-N. O-L-O-G-Y, nanotechnology. He's the one that when you go to your ATM machine, you wouldn't be able to use it without his fiber optics. How many use ATM? You wouldn't be able to use your cell phone without his fiber optics. You wouldn't be able to Google or use Facebook without his fiber optics. But most black people don't even know about him. And he's a black man. And he's still thriving. He's right now getting ready to introduce to the world the fastest bullet, uh, bullet train in the world. When you saw on Black Panther, they was using nanotechnology. How many saw that when he was talking about it? How, how the train is actually riding on, on air, pretty much. That's nanotechnology. A black man invented that. Just give him a hand. It's okay. You wouldn't have a cell phone if it wasn't for him. Now, I know they put white people out front and say they're the ones that did it, but they couldn't have done it if they didn't have this type of technology. And Black Panther showed it so you can at least get a good idea of how nanotechnology works, where, where you got a train like riding on air and it's a bullet uh, train, getting the destination real quick, going all over the place, that is thanks to Dr. Thomas Mensa. He's the one who invented it. And China right now is trying, to, is trying to get that same technology, and I believe they started one, and they had a bullet plane going on, I mean a bullet train going for a while, but it doesn't do what this brother is doing right now. Matter of fact, they had to get him to come and help in certain areas. United States want to get the same bullet train. But he said Ghana is going to be next to have a bullet train in Ghana. Our people are doing some great stuff. The issue is we don't hear about it. We don't hear about it until it's up and then they put a white face in front of it. That's called whitewashing and that's called rewriting. So as long as you can think you're dumb and stupid and your kids can think they can't do anything, that's where the mass of people want you to be at. This brother has over 25 other patents, seven U.S. patents and fiber optics. You know how huge that is? Seven U.S. patents and fiber optics? That means he own it. And every, every place in the world is trying to get him to come over so they can get bullet planes going on in their communities. He is now in the process of creating the world's first bullet plane in Ghana. He has, like I said, over seven U.S. patents. Now, Africa is returning to her true greatness. That's the point I want to leave you with. So what was the problem in Africa? We're going to answer that question. What was the problem in Africa? The problem in Africa was the European puppet masters who were, are now losing the influence over African leaders. And when that influence is totally gone, you're going to see Africa rising. Because the continent right now is pretty much saying they do not want any more help from the Europeans. They do not want any more aid. I mean, they literally said it. They don't want to be the poster child for destruction and all of that. 
They do not want to have their babies shown as uh, stomachs all big and no one can help them. Right now, the continent is declaring war on the world, saying that we're going to support ourselves and we're going to build our nations up and we do not want your aid. So what I want you to know today, the problem in Africa is the same problem that we have in America in some of our communities, and that's poor leadership. And that poor leadership starts at the top. We have black people that want power, black people that want uh, property, black people that want um, prestige and popularity, and black people that want to be self-important. And it's those issues that are keeping us as a people in this diaspora to rise. But I tell you right now, that's changing. It's changing because the young people that are in this church are hearing something that they're not going to do. They're not going to be out there trying to do crazy stuff. There are young people all over the world that are being re-educated. Young people all over the world that are understanding for the first time that they got to do more, they got to be better than their parents. Young people all over the world are coming together and realizing that we can make a difference in our communities and we can help our people to rise. Amen? If you can receive it and believe it, stand to your feet and give God a hand praise in the house of God.